Welcome to the Hallenstein Center's new online program, Lunch and Learn. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney. During our quarantine, we may not be able to journey beyond our homes, but that should not stop us from journeying beyond our minds. Today, let's start our journey with the French political philosopher, Alexis de Tocqueville. He traveled through North America in the early 1830s and observed that American citizens were the most can-do people in the world. They were self-confident, self-reliant, and self-directed. Because the frontier was out of government's reach, the pioneers helped each other, building up America's civil society with their volunteer efforts. Think of the old fashioned barn raising, or nowadays the Red Cross volunteers who show up in droves to help a community that suffered a natural disaster. Today, almost all of the United States is experiencing the natural disaster called the COVID-19 pandemic. Thankfully, the American character has not changed much since Tocqueville's day. Hopefully, we're better than ever. For there are individuals in our communities who are self-starters and are moved to help their fellow citizens through the present crisis. One such individual in West Michigan is Nate Gillespie, a 2018 graduate of Grand Valley State University and our Houndstein Center's Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. Nate works at a private equity firm called OXO Investment Partners. You may also have seen him interviewed on Meet the Press on NBC a few months back. He's also a social entrepreneur who saw a need and founded the Coronavirus Civilian Corps, the new CCC. My conversation with Nate will go about 30 minutes, followed by questions from our viewers. Our goal is not to go longer than about 45 minutes, so feel free to begin sending your questions to us right away using the Zoom toolbar to do so. Nate, thank you for joining me. Uh, tell us where your great idea to help our community came from. Well, first, Gleaves, thanks for the opportunity to join everyone on this lovely Thursday afternoon and for the opportunity to share a little bit about our effort. Uh, we're, we're very excited to, to have this opportunity as a team, and I personally thank you as well. Um, so as far as the origination for the effort went, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, a lot of friends and I started to get pretty concerned about the coronavirus as we were observing the news and seeing it evolve overseas and had increasing concern about what that could look like domestically if it should start to spread a lot throughout the, the U.S. here. And then getting closer and closer to the point where everything shut down, uh, we all kind of had a feeling of helplessness that it didn't seem like uh, the country as a whole, even the community, didn't feel like everyone was responding as uh, in a fashion as expedited as we felt necessary and eventually got to the point where we said, well, why are we sitting back concerned and complaining that we don't see a concerted effort to prevent some health and economic catastrophes we feel like are coming? Why don't we ourselves uh, raise our hands and see how we can help? So I initiated um, uh, just through text the Monday night that um, again, the restaurants and bars and coffee shops all shut down, reached out to a couple of buddies and had enthusiastic, unanimous response uh, to engage in an effort of this kind. And so as our small group of friends got excited about the ways we could help out in the community, we realized, well, if this sample set is indicative of a, a broader population's interest to help and serve, uh, why just keep it to ourselves? Why not expand? And so thus began a a broader concerted effort to build a more of an organized coalition and official effort to respond to what we felt like we're, we're going to and now we're experiencing some pretty dramatic uh, economic effects primarily and health effects in our broader West Michigan community. So how did this organization begin to evolve? Tell us what's happened over the past three weeks. So once we realized that interest and started to kind of think creatively about how we could um, more mobilize an official effort, the first step was really an intelligence gathering exercise. Our goal from the beginning wasn't to recreate the wheel. We know there are a lot of wheels out there in the community that are already set up in a sophisticated fashion to meet different specific needs uh, from uh, work in the homelessness population to kids food basket and a bevy of volunteer and giving opportunities that existed. So the first goal was to do this intelligence gathering exercise to see what was out there, understand better how 
we could partner alongside some of these existing organizations. The second step was talking to community leaders and stakeholders. My goal with that from the beginning was to find the 10 or so folks who are most connected in their geographies or within their regions of expertise around West Michigan and get a better understanding of what was happening, what needed to happen, and how we could fill that void. And then the third step was get everyone uh, from a volunteer and donor perspective, a team member rather, those folks getting those uh, that cohort excited about the effort for it to actually be a part of the frontline response. So intelligence gathering, um, starting to build community stakeholder relationships, and then uh, just really recruiting all in all. So, sorry, tell me. No, to this, well, to this point then, what's been your biggest roadblock or frustration? So I, I think the hardest part about starting an organized effort in the period of social distancing and not being able to gather together is simply that. We can't organize everybody in a room and give a couple speeches and have volunteer sign-up sheets. Everything is done remotely. Conversations are done more on a one-off or smaller group level. So simply mobilizing and organizing an effort of this kind uh, has its own inherent challenges uh, when everything is online. So I would say that's a big piece. And then something we're actively thinking now uh, that I can talk to more in the various uh, specific efforts that we have going as far as our operating model uh, is just engaging people, getting folks excited about what we're doing and therefore get excited about serving and giving in the community, um, providing and creating that team feel that I think we are starting to have a real solid grip on now but as we grow uh how do you connect everyone together to feel like they're a part of a coherent organized effort when we're all in our our living rooms well tell us about your fundraising campaign with mel trotter ministries sure so let me back up just a little bit to give context on the three ways we're operating right now then i'd love to jump into the specific mel trotter campaign so as we built out the organization, we realized there were three primary areas we could uh, best operate in the community that we were best positioned to help with. And we view those three functions as best summed up by three words, serve, give, and spend. The serve component is simply volunteerism of any and every kind related to um, you know, folks or organizations that have been impacted negatively by the coronavirus, which is really all of us. So that effort, ranges from food delivery, blood drives, to any and every circumstance where human physical resources are needed to help in this crisis. As you can imagine, that has its own set of challenges in a shelter at home uh, situation. So the only opportunities that we're working on right now are ones where strict safety protocols are adhered to and that are carved out in the governor's executive order as being okay exercises and necessary volunteer efforts in this time. The giving piece of which I'll talk more about with Mel Trotter specifically is, I've been calling it micro fundraising. It's small dollar donations from a lot of folks that represent our broader core. Definitely skews towards a younger group, students, uh, younger professionals or recent graduates like myself who are probably just getting started in their careers or perhaps were um, you know, furloughed by, by recent layoffs. Um, so folks that maybe don't have as deep of pockets, but if you get enough people to donate, you can really make a real economic dent at scale. So our goal is to find specific areas where nonprofit or other organizations have a given need above and beyond with local philanthropy is already covering. And there are many generous efforts out there today uh, and what local, state and federal aid might be able to cover. Um, the, Third piece before I'll jump into Mel Trotter is spend, which are targeted spend campaigns for local small businesses and organizations that we feel have been most impacted by the crisis, primarily restaurants, bakeries, coffee shops, where we'll send as many people from our group as possible to uh, a restaurant, for example, like last night was Arnie's Bakery, who's been doing some tremendous work in the community in their own right. Um, we tried to go spend as much money there as we possibly could. So we coordinate with owners to make sure we're not uh, 
with creating and sending too many folks uh, and, and over mobbing uh, a restaurant above their capacity at the time. So all that said, the Mel Trotter campaign arose out of a concern for, it's hard to put a, a real ranking to it, but one of at least our most at-risk populations, uh, primarily the homeless population, of which uh, if impacted um, significantly by this virus could, could really experience some significant tragedy. So out of our concern with that and out of some relationships that I had with folks over at Mel Trotter, we began to have some conversations with them around needs they had originally from a volunteer perspective and then came to understand a very significant monthly need in excess of usual budget given their enhanced capacity with higher demand from uh, folks that may have just stayed on the streets that were now looking for shelter and food more consistently. So what we are trying to do is raise as much money through our effort uh, right now through our Facebook page and, and through the link I can share uh, to you believes to share with everyone that has interest in participating in this effort. Uh, we're trying our best to rally up a, a couple thousand dollars to at least dent some of those extra costs that they have and then hopefully find uh, some some generous individuals to potentially even do uh, dollar matches on some of that donation. So that's a little bit on Mel Trotter. Really exciting development. And it makes me wonder, Nate, what do you think, where would you like this coronavirus civilian core, the CCC, to go? So as an organization. Our goal is so our goal is, is very focused in West Michigan right now. So building this effort into an even more sophisticated model where we're able to tackle multiple volunteer efforts a week. We're doing maybe double the number of targeted bank campaigns we're doing now and increasingly uh, growing in our effectiveness on the fundraising side. So growing the West Michigan effort. The second piece of where I'd like to see the organization go is, is really fill a, a critical gap I've noticed in our community from a, a volunteer and team member perspective on the other side of it. The folks directly involved and interested in helping out with the CCC, many of them have had a rather significant piece of their identity stripped away based on this crisis. It's hard to feel like a student when you aren't in the classroom anymore. It's hard to feel like you're a college athlete when you aren't practicing with your team every day. It's hard to have the same enjoyment one may have gotten out of work on a daily basis when your hourly job or, or service industry position, or in the situation of even my wife, um, who was furloughed from her position um, at AHC Hospitality. There's an identity gap that's there, and, and my goal and hope is for the CCC to embody uh, at least a catalyst of purpose for some of these awesome volunteers and folks who are involved in what we're doing to at least fill a portion of that void and then mobilize that energy into the community. The final piece of where I'd like to see the organization go is I've gotten the number of very interested inbound uh, messages for folks that aren't in Grand Rapids. And right now we're focused in Grand Rapids, um, but we'd like to inspire cloned efforts in and around Michigan, in and around the Midwest. The model of our effort is very simple. And we're encouraging folks to steal it, take the, take the brand, take the, the idea, and start up a similar effort in their own community to hopefully influence a scale we couldn't simply manage just from here in West Michigan. Terrific. And who are some of your allies and your informal partners in this effort? There are so many uh, institutions and individuals who have been very generous with their time, uh, with connecting us with the right resources to best position our effort, and they themselves uh, directly getting involved. So it, it's hard to name everybody, but some of the, the larger constituents include Grand Valley has been tremendously helpful in working with the Dean of the Business School of Seedman College of Business's office. Uh, they've been fantastic in providing some uh, students in administrative functions to help us out, connecting us with volunteer opportunities, and we in turn are trying to do our best to connect them to opportunities to serve. The Grand Rapids Chamber as well is a very well-connected organization in the business community. They've been wonderful in helping direct some of our efforts towards restaurants and small businesses that are most in need. And then nonprofits that we've started to, to either work with or have conversations around Maybe we want some of the shelter at home order slows a bit, areas where we can increase our volunteer efforts even more, 
Kids Food Basket, YWCA, the Junior League, um, and even folks involved in the city government. Um, city Commissioner Melinda Sassi was very generous and in, in um, blasting out a note through her social media about our effort and helping us find ways to get involved in the second ward. Uh, Kent County Commissioner Jim Thalen has been tremendously helpful as well. So just a handful of folks that come to mind that have been helpful, as well as all the volunteers that we have. So what's this experience taught you about West Michigan as a place for social entrepreneurs such as yourself to deliver philanthropy to the community? I think West Michigan is arguably the, the most generous community that I've ever interacted with. Um, a personal story, before my wife Nicole uh, was laid off from her position uh, at AHC Hospitality or Amway Hotel Corporation, the families very generously offered to pay every single employee for six weeks um, after a time of being laid off. And the generosity that that embodies just from the leadership of some of our most uh, successful and generous uh, families all the way down to organizations that have really banded together to organize a concerted effort towards reducing the negative impact we're seeing uh, in and throughout West Michigan from a health and economic perspective. So many stories that I could tell just from my experience with all of this that I've interacted with, but in this generous city, it's not, uh, it's not hard to get folks to band together uh, to solve problems. Everyone is very interested, at least that I've talked to, in selflessly giving of themselves their time and their money towards making lives that are really hurting now just a little bit better. Now, there have got to be a lot of people out there listening to you, Nate, and they see a need in their community. And they think they could also be a social entrepreneur. Maybe it's an untapped talent that they are exploring right now. Well, you've blazed a path now. And so what are the steps they should go through, they should keep in mind, to get an organization in their community up and running the way you did? Well, first off, um, I'd be happy to chat with anyone that wants to um, maybe bounce some ideas off of any of us in, in and around our organization as they're individually thinking about either starting their own effort or coming alongside folks. We'd love to have everyone uh, that's interested in that as well join our effort and help us in, in our mission. Uh, as far as specific advice goes, uh, taking all of this with a grain of salt since we've only been doing this for about three weeks, so we're, we're quite new to it ourselves. Uh, our experience has, has taught us, and my experience has taught me, um, if you have an idea or a way you'd like to serve or give, uh, make sure it doesn't already exist, because if it does exist, join that effort and make it even stronger. And if it doesn't, uh, do your best to, as I outlined those steps earlier, gather intelligence about existing, uh, the existing issue that you want to tackle. Find the people who are best positioned to intelligently, um, with wisdom from their own direct experience in that capacity, come alongside you to help mentor or be a part of your effort. And then recruit as many people that you can. Uh, this effort is only coming smarter than I am and more organized than I am around me saying we should do this or we should do that has really realized itself in a pretty exciting and inspiring fashion in our experience. So those would just be some small points. Like I said, always happy to be a resource to anyone who has any questions in that regard. If people want to become more involved with the CC, how can they do so? So a number of ways and and everything is growing and evolving and in flux right now so the the direct capacities to get involved will increasingly grow and also change a little bit as far as where we're so right now we have a facebook page that's kind of the hub of our operation we also have uh, an instagram account where we're posting about our efforts to remind folks of ways to get involved uh, we'll be building out the rest of our social media existence over the week and we're working on a website that will hopefully be a good centralized location for everyone that doesn't have a specific social media account. I like I didn't for a very long time to be able to follow our effort. So the most direct way would be to follow the Facebook page and to reach out to myself or, or a number of other folks um, that are involved in our effort that I can put people in contact with that are leading various components of what we're doing. A direct ask that I'd uh, 
would encourage anyone interested to get involved with immediately is that Mel Trotter fundraising effort. Every dollar towards that counts. One additional thing I didn't mention earlier is Mel Trotter broadly received a very, very generous offer, uh, I believe from a wealthy individual that uh, has agreed to match any dollars donated one to one up to $100,000. So every dollar given to that effort directly is duplicated. Uh, we hope to multiply it even more in the ways I spoke of earlier. So there are a number of ways to get involved, uh, but those are the ways I encourage folks to get linked up to as far as seeing the central locations for every, everything about what we're doing. Well, Nate, you know this next question is coming. How did the Hallenstein Center's Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy help prepare you to discover your new calling as a social entrepreneur? Yes, uh, well, it, it was an absolutely wonderful experience um, for me. It was the highlight of my college career for sure. It was a fantastic foundation of general leadership principles and being surrounded by all those incredible case studies of leadership, uh, the various exercises in leadership we went through, the talks we were exposed to, the leaders that were brought in, and that we all got to directly speak to them from all of that was a critical foundation uh, for me in the journey that I'm ever experiencing and becoming the type of leader I, I want to become. Um, the folks that led the effort, you know, Chad Dowding, Hugh Gleaves, and, and the rest of the team were all wonderful uh, mentors and continue to be so. Um, an incredible staff at the Hallenstein Center and a ton of marvelous students. Very talented, diverse core of individuals got to directly learn from and represent a pretty disproportionate number of my close friends today. Good to hear. Well, Nate, we have a, a number of listeners who've queued up to ask questions, so let's bring them into our conversation. Our first, I think that we should field is from Anonymous. Did you model the CCC on any particular group or organization? And if so, why did you choose that group? That's a great question. There's not necessarily one organization that we modeled our efforts out of. There may be similar organizations that have existed in very similar capacities to what we're doing. Certainly most grassroots efforts have similar models to what we do across a variety of fronts. Um, we looked at a lot of different things um, as far as existing efforts out there in West Michigan and around the country as far as best practices from organizations that already exist, to my earlier point about what's out there, what can you learn from it. Um, but there wasn't necessarily one organization. Uh, and frankly, while we did do a lot of research on the front end of how we could model things and organize an effort and build a structure to best, uh, best be positioned to serve as many people as possible, we're kind of making things up as we go in a sense, because we didn't want to wait a week to structure something when there was a need tomorrow. And so we've been very active in our involvement and continue to learn from other efforts and organizations we know of or learn about um, as we go along here. Another question by, this is a different anonymous. How do you select the businesses you're going to focus on for your targeted spending? So that's an ever increasing list. There's a number of great, uh, great centralized locations that different organizations have built out as far as full lists of ways you can uh, thoughtfully spend your money as a whole. And we try to uh, very liberally steal from those as much as we can. Early on, the list was very much skewed towards our favorite restaurants uh, that we also knew were doing great things in and around the community. So there's there's no necessary formula uh, for selecting the next restaurant or small business for these targeted spend campaigns. But what we've been trying to do early on consistently is highlight businesses that are doing more and going far above and beyond the call of duty uh, in this current time to help folks around them. An example like Arnie's Bakery yesterday was our targeted spend campaign that we conducted, uh, great food, but what they're doing that's really fascinated us is from two to four every day, they, through donations from their suppliers and from their own, their own materials, are giving away food, uh, primarily bread, to anyone that needs it, no questions asked, 
again, from two to four every single day. They gave away 6,000 loaves of bread last week. So groups like that deserve to be uh, well rewarded for their efforts as much as possible because they're doing wonderful things to keep their communities afloat. So whatever little bit we can do to help companies like that, uh, the more the merrier. You know, during Holy Week, I can't help but think of the multiplication of loaves. It, that story is just remarkable. We have some great people in this community. Here's another question. This is also by an anonymous writer. How do you foresee the CCC changing in the next few months as the status of the pandemic changes? So it's tough to say because no one knows what's going to happen. So our goal is to evolve and meet the needs that arise at each step of this crisis of this pandemic. So we don't see any, uh, any lack of need, especially on the economic side, even once the direct health risk from the pandemic subsides. So as the crisis continues to hit our community, that, that we fear will continue to be a, a more forceful impact over time, we want to meet and match that with, uh, with directly helping in any way we can, whether that's uh, continuing to deliver food with organizations that are doing that, uh, volunteer on the front lines wherever we can, or continue these targeted spend campaigns and fundraisers to come alongside organizations and small businesses that are still reeling from the impact of this thing. Again, we don't, we don't think this uh, will subside anytime soon, but as the, the needs arise, we want to evolve to meet them directly. Yeah, you know, the health experts say that the uh, pandemic may have two, three, four different waves. We just don't know. They may come back another year or two mutated. So perhaps there'll be a very long life in this phase. But say the pandemic ends, what happens to the CCC then? So there are a number of different uh, theories on this internally, and and our efforts have been much more focused on what impacting the groups and organizations and individuals that are struggling right now, but we are definitely thinking about the future. So um, we don't want the effort to die and the momentum to subside once, uh, once this virus hopefully goes away as soon as possible. So we want to continue to be a, a meaningful effort in the community, helping those in need. Uh, there is certainly no lack of needs on a normalized basis. Those needs are just heightened more public in a pandemic. So we want to continue to help the community in every way we can. Um, in and around West Michigan or in and around the United States as other areas may still be reeling from this in a worse uh, capacity than West Michigan. Detroit comes to mind. So we, right. we want to keep, uh, keep up the momentum and, and be able to help wherever possible. Well, your friends, Kendall Wingrove writes from Lansing, what can society do to inspire more young people to follow in your footsteps, Nate? Well, um, hardly, hardly only my question, footsteps. By the way. I'd like to think that I'm following in, in many other uh, wonderful leaders' uh, footsteps and all of the folks involved in our effort are certainly. Um, as far as a more uh, centralized effort, even than what we're doing, uh, comes to mind a, a, a incremental almost to inspire uh, a core of volunteers to effectively meet the needs across the state of Michigan or across the country. Um, efforts at a scale of you know, even the Peace Corps come to mind that seem to be obvious solutions to many of the problems that we have today, inspiring a, a statewide, uh, countrywide, or even international effort to mobilize to fight all of the negative effects of this thing. It, it seems like a, a hopefully a fantastic idea that folks in those leadership positions are already mulling over and working to put into effect as soon as possible. Nate, is there anything else you would like to mention that we haven't covered? Uh, I don't know, some call to arms? Well, I think in summary, our goal is to help as many people as we can, and that takes ideas around blind spots that we don't have as far as existing needs for our serve, give, and spend efforts. Uh, and that also takes volunteers and people directly joining the effort. So we would encourage and be absolutely delighted to have as many people that, is, that want to be involved with what we're doing as possible to join our team. Uh, 
whether uh, you want to give of your time and serve in a, a safe capacity, whether uh, you would rather stay at home and you have a couple extra dollars laying around that you'd like to give towards a meaningful frontline effort, uh, or if you're hungry, I know which I am about seven times a day, uh, join one of our targeted spend campaigns and uh, come out with us as we try to bless some local businesses that are blessing their communities. So we invite everyone to join our effort and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you feel the same way. Thank you, Nate Gillespie, for sharing your story and inspiring our listeners. Our listeners now can see why you were such a star in our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy, why it was such a joy to mentor you then and to continue to mentor you now. Thanks also to our listeners who tuned in, and I invite you to Zoom in at the same time next Tuesday when my guest will be Dr. Michael Ryan. Dr. Ryan has spent more than four decades as a psychologist helping young people with learning disabilities, helping veterans cope with some of the traumas of their experiences overseas and of war, who come back and maybe have trouble reintegrating into society. We're gonna talk about some of those issues. So till next Thursday, next Tuesday at 1 p.m., stay tuned and stay well. Thanks for watching.